Is there any crueler move than hiding a video game super weapon in the final moments of a game, or handing over a mighty boomstick only to rip it out of our hands minutes later? These are the teasing moments that make you say, wait, Samus's arm cannon had a powerful death beam all along? Or you mean there was a spare Metal Gear just sitting on an island? Why didn't you tell me that before the terrible Prague level? And where was Modern Warfare 3's Juggernaut armor when I was dying a billion times on Mile High Club on Veteran? I'm not cross, just very disappointed and perforated. So today we salute the weapons that burned twice as bright and twice as fast, though weirdly that doesn't include the flamethrower from Zombies Ate My Neighbours, which did both of those things thanks to only having 400 fuel for the entire game. Consider it a bonus 8th entry, one we promise not to snatch away from you as we look at the 7 greatest weapons you only got to use once. Beware of spoilers for the following. overblown combos, rail grinding and absurd weaponry, Sunset Overdrive is what you'd get if Tony Hawk and Ratchet and Clank had a baby, which is a mental image that is less insomniac games and more insomnia inducing. It is not a game where you feel shortchanged by the gun rack, offering up a selection of firework pistols, acid sprinklers and hairspray bombs. Short of having a cannon that fires Haribo, it's like they took the inside of a 10 year old's head and plastered it onto the screen. But even this world has the one weapon that gets away. Enter Excalamune, the answer to the question, what do you get the ninja cheerleader who has everything? Now, if I were a cheerleader, what would I want? Hmm, no. Remember, these are badass assassins. Yes, a sword. Sunset City won't hand over the treasure, forcing you to steal the sword from a slimy executive hiding behind robots and a hefty climb to his penthouse. Nice digs! Now where's that sword? I honestly resent the exercise more than the death robots. I must pay for my crimes with business seppuku, so I am retiring upstate, taking nothing with me but my priceless antique Japanese or possibly Chinese sword. Oh, what the hell? With the sword gone, you have to smelt a new blade from the Execs Marketing Awards, which in the universe of Sunset Overdrive means pushing a power plant to overheat and hammering the metal from a thousand feet up in the air. disappointed teenagers signed up for blacksmithing class after this. Douse the smouldering blade and Excalamune is born. I dub the Excalamune! And she is a beaut, spitting lightning and flames, not to mention regaining health for every kill, Excalamune makes the rest of the weapon wheel pale in comparison. Yes, next to this apocalyptic blade, every other gun puts the ass in arsenal. Or for our American viewers, the ass in assorted weapons you own. But enjoy that rampage while it lasts as a clumsy accident sees its powers nuked for good. Wait! Look how powerful this thing is! Oh shit. That was an accident! Honestly, you nearly vaporize one lousy kid. Hmm, they neutered my nuclear sword. For a small subset of players, the weapon you only get to use once in Demon Souls is the first weapon of the game as you meet your first dregling, die in embarrassing fashion and swear off ever playing the thing again. 
Persevere, however, and the game is reasonably even-handed with its weapons, in that you'll likely get your head bashed in no matter what you're carrying. It's a bully, but it's a very egalitarian bully. And yes, I hope by saying these nice things it won't take my lunch money. <laughs> But for one glorious moment, there's a sword that turns you into the God of Thunder, a ray of hope that appears just after these rays of despair. Waiting for you at the end of the Shrine of Storms is the Storm King and his squad of Diddy Storm Princes. They are not your average stingrays. Bang on their tank at the local aquarium and they will bang right back. For a non-ranged combat character, this would be a real sticking point as they stay in the air, raining down giant shards. Which is why developer From Software mercifully includes the nearby Storm Ruler, a sword capable of channeling a fork of deadly thunderous force on any enemy in your path, or as it's called in some circles, Pikachu in Smash Bros. Down Special. It was cheesy and amazing in Smash, and it is cheesy and amazing here that even the mighty Storm King himself can be comfortably zapped by a gnat on the ground makes this unlike any other boss fight in From Software history. Pure visual spectacle and zero frustration. Alas, the Altar of Storms is the only location where Storm Ruler commands this mighty power. In any other area, it's a woefully underpowered hunk of junk with poor durability. Truly demon souls giveth and demon souls taketh away and then taketh and taketh and taketh some more. Giveth us a break, yeah? We've had Excalamune and now Excalibur. Lara Croft enjoys a short and sordid affair with King Arthur's legendary blade in Tomb Raider Legend. Look, the joke works better written down, okay? This is brilliant. King Arthur was real. The Knights of the Round Table were real. And now we have Excalibur right here in front of us. Those stodgy bastards at Oxford will have kittens when they hear of this. Yes, a discovery so exciting that Lara's pal Zip forgets all manners and puts his trainers on a white sofa. Who brought the super glue? I'm amazed Croft Manor doesn't have a shoes off policy. Arthur's mythical murder stick was broken into several parts, presumably to get it past airport security when it was being scattered across the globe. Really, it's just an excuse to visit locations as exotic as Japan, Peru and, um, Cornwall, which is quite a quaint bit of England, better known for its great cream teas rather than its giant sea serpents. The only thing I've ever fought in Cornwall was heartburn from all the pasties. Also good. Lara spends most of the game searching for sword pieces, only really pausing to throw grenades at snow leopards because, lest we forget, she can't go five minutes without killing some endangered wildlife. Eventually in Nepal, she constructs the blade, and Excalibur lives up to the legends, and then some. I don't recall Arthurian tales mentioning an ability to cleave stone doors in two or firing bursts of green death, but there you go. Now we know how young Arthur became king. After an entire game spent pecking away at enemy health with weedy handguns, Lara transforms into a gymnastic Grim Reaper, and it is glorious. They even have to conjure up horrible smoke monster the unknown entity just to make her break a sweat. So much of Tomb Raider's magic lies in the platforming and puzzling, so the ability to slice through endangered species like a hot knife through nearly extinct butter would have made the preceding levels so much more fun. But no, Excalibur only gets the briefest moment to shine. But hey, think of all the snow leopards that'll rest easy.
few series boast as many one-fight wonder weapons as The Legend of Zelda. Who could forget donning the fierce deity mask to wipe the grin from Majora's Moon, or unspooling a fishing rod in Twilight Princess to confuse Ganondorf? That's some pretty fly fishing. Some of Link's weapons have such restricted use it took decades to even discover their combat potential. Did you know that rather than prune the plant boss in Wind Waker's woods, you can purify it with sacred forest water? Ha! Get good, shrub. In some ways, Breath of the Wild takes these ideas to their logical conclusion. Due to the game's weapon degradation system, it's arguable that every sword, shield and bow can only be used once. As allegedly legendary weapons shatter against flimsy bokoblins, it can begin to feel that they're more plasterboard than master sword. But no such embarrassment for the Bow of Light, which arrives in your final moment of need when Dark Beast Ganon emerges on Hyrule Field. He has given up on reincarnation and assumed his pure, enraged form. Huh, that's exactly what they say about me when I step on Lego. Luckily, this is Zelda's cue to finally crack out the good stuff. I entrust you with the Bow of Light, a powerful weapon in the face of evil. A more cynical observer might point out that with a dark beast that big, it would be hard for any bow to miss. But that ignores the satisfaction of lighting up the mega pig with Triforce bullseyes and sniping him dramatically from horseback. And an even more cynical observer might also point out that the bow doesn't appear long enough to degrade, but it actually can't. It has infinite durability, which combined with an attack power of 100 and infinite arrows makes this the most desirable bow in the game. So when Link finally glides into the air to deliver that final death blow, remember that you're not just vanquishing the ultimate evil, but also that lovely bow. Was it worth it? No, Link. Probably, yeah. Originally released on the Nintendo 64, Chirok Dinosaur Hunter was famous for two things. A draw distance so drowned in fog that it doubled as a Victorian London pea super simulator, and an unstoppable weapon that made you jump through a ludicrous number of hoops for mere seconds of use. Which is odd, as there is nothing else ludicrous about this story of a Native American hunter fighting velociraptors armed with laser cannons. The gun in question is the Chrono Scepter, which is split into pieces hidden across the game's eight levels. The only way you could possibly find them is if you had the nose of a bloodhound, or a tips book from a Nintendo magazine if you're not allowed pets in the house. Some pieces required perilous first-person jumping, and remember, this was years before first-person platforming became good. That's currently scheduled for 2035. Level 7 really took the biscuit, and then dunked that biscuit into hot magma. For this one, you were expected to swim through water disguised as lava, ensuring that most sensible dinosaur hunters, an oxymoron if we ever heard one, would never go near it. And your reward for sniffing out every Cretaceous cranny? A sort of weird stick with a blender on the end and a whole three bullets, count them, to use with it. <laughs> and only one enemy left to use it on. The game's final boss, the Campaigner. After all that work, seeing this weird kitchen implement burp out blue mushroom clouds is a tad anticlimactic, but it does chew through his health bar faster than a velociraptor gnawing off Samuel L. Jackson's arm. Having this gun anywhere else in the game would have constituted an extinction-level event. The irony is, it was the Chrono Scepter the campaigner was searching for the whole game. If only he had the tips book, eh? Hey? So we so finally we meet, meet again. again. She, she's huge! Be careful! Listen well, all you demons of the underworld! In the name of the goddess Palatina, defender of all that is good! Those who hide in the darkness will be made to face the light! Kid Icarus Uprising has the dubious honour of having not one but two god-tier weapons that vanish almost as soon as they appear. It's all part of the 2012 reboot's everything but the kitchen sink approach to design. After all, this is the game that included no less than 90 difficulty tiers, an entire peripheral just to hold the 3DS while playing, and a stage where you played as both a toddler and a dog. Oh, oh no, 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 no! Shh. 
Should have called it Kid Icarus Pup Rising. But even in this stew of ideas, Pitt's divine weaponry stands out. First up are the three sacred treasures, the Arrow of Light, the Mirror Shield, and the Wings of Pegasus. Gathering them in the game's opening stretch readies you for Medusa, arming you with piercing bolts and cutting insults. Wow! Warping that huge body must be a real pain! Who are you calling up? Thanks to the three sacred weapons, the Gorgon is soon Gorgon, only to unmask an even bigger threat during the end credits. Now wait just a second. Huh? Did you hear something? I said, I said wait, wait just, just a second. second. You've got to be hearing things. <laughs> Hades? Who's Hades? The true master of the underworld. Sorry to keep you waiting. And it's this loquacious Lucifer, channeling the spirit of every English baddie in cinema history, who robs Pitt of his wonderful toys. No, that felt good. Not the three sacred treasures! But there's no time to mourn, for as the old saying goes, when the going gets tough, the tough seek out a strange old man in space and ask him for a mech. This is the giant sacred treasure, and because nothing in Kid Icarus Uprising is free, you have to fight for the right to ride it. Now this is where it's at! After enduring several hours of peacocking from Hades, it's hugely cathartic to have a weapon capable of matching him. Whether it's peppering his dumb mug with lasers... Did I beat him? No, I'm fine. But I could have sprained my ankle, you know. Transforming into a sort of Gundam swan to chase him at light speed... Engaging for suit mode! or peeling away his armour. If the great sacred treasure could be used in other levels, it would be a bloodbath, which is probably why Uprising sees it trashed with a drill and a sucker punch. <laughs> Foolish Hades leaves you with just enough of a cannon arm to send him packing, but our dreams of an easy ride die with him. But hey, who needs a great weapon when you've got a good boy? Resident Evil, one of the few game series where using amazing weapons once is often your own fault. If you're anything like us, you hoard magnum and grenade rounds until you accidentally reach the final boss with enough stopping power to make the T-Virus look like a case of the sniffles. <laughs> Classic Resident Evil, where the only thing cheesier than these tactics is the dialogue. Your wife? Yeah, my wife and kids. They always wait up for me. Even today, my eldest daughter. I didn't mean to. It's okay. He's alive. I just know. But Resident Evil 3 preempted our terrible tendencies with the introduction of Nemesis, an unstoppable bullet sponge slash world's angriest bin bag. We're talking Michael Myers from Halloween levels of unkillable here, as the game begins to sound like a violent remake of Bop It. Electrocute it. Ram it. RPG it. Of course, if you're struggling with a stubborn, hard-to-remove monster, only one product will get the job done. In the climactic boss fight against Nemesis's final form, Jill Valentine finally decides to give it the finger. <laughs> Finger, of course, as you'll know if you watched our video on tortured acronyms, stands for Ferromagnetic Infantry Use Next Generation Railgun, which is quite like the Ferromagnetic Infantry Use Last Generation Railgun, only it costs £200 more and has faster loading times. Well, I say faster. With a cumbersome reloading process that involves slowly pushing the gun's giant batteries into the wall, we can understand why Capcom didn't let us point the finger elsewhere in the game. Instead, you only get to fire the finger three times in Resident Evil 3, so it's lucky that Capcom gives each of those cracking shots the power of the Mighty Thor, which is going to make Nemesis feel Mighty Thor. And with Nemesis on the ropes, you can finally give him his just desserts. Ow. 
And what follows dessert? The cheese board. All this death wasn't caused by a monster making a virus. It was green. Gah, I can't bear it. So those were the seven greatest weapons you only got to use once. Due to how fast these creations flash in and out of existence, you'll forgive us if we blinked and missed any other classic examples. But you could add them to the comments below to help immortalise them for future generations. And if you like this, then why not check out some of the other videos on screen now? Uh, they're all from us, and if you enjoyed this, we're pretty sure you will enjoy them as well. And why not like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. See you next time!